When did the end day start? Oh, gee, that was a long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago, the end day started. Yeah, they actually started about then. So for us, we say we live in the end days, new times, when did it start? Okay, today we're going to go into the book of Revelation. I know it's not many people like to do that, but uh, it's actually a book that's been written for us today, right now. See, 100 years ago, or even probably 50 years ago, we didn't have the understanding we have today. And today is the understanding we need to have to be able to decipher the book of Revelation. It's written in such a way that we can see today's technology in here. For example, the two witnesses. It says with the two witnesses that they will be dead for three days and the whole world will see it at the same time. Not possible up until they put up the Skynet. Now you can get internet around the planet anywhere. Not one piece of the planet is not exposed to it. So you can sit there with your iPhone, iPad, whatever technical gadget you have, and you can stream live video from anywhere in the world, to anywhere in the world today. So technology has made that possible. And another piece of technology, we have Aaron here, and he's got this fantastic ministry. And his ministry is taking the word of God to millions of people. It might not be that number today, but it will be tomorrow. Praise your Father for the errands of the world who are taking your word to the masses and media, Lord, who are humble enough to not believe that they are making as big an impact as they really are. Praise your Lord that the blessings you shower upon him will take him further into your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's take a look at <clears throat> when did the end day start? So I'm going to start looking at the uh, seals, the seven seals. The first is it's uh, Revelation 6.2 is where we start. For those that want to follow in the Bible. Now I'm going to be dropping a lot of pieces of a lot of uh, scriptural references. So if you're not fast enough to write them down, you can always turn on YouTube and follow Aaron's wonderful ministry and pick it up off YouTube. Okay, so <clears throat> the Lamb breaks the first of six seals, it's chapter 6. So Revelation 6, 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, not to be mistaken for the description of the return of Jesus in Revelation 19, 11, he had many crowns, and he also had a sword, not a bow. So if we look at this piece of scripture, it really comes down to referring to those that are working to bring about the rise of the first feast, or Antichrist, as we know. When did this happen? Well, let's take a look at history, because if you, if you learn your history, you can also learn your future. You know the saying, for those that don't learn history, are doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we see the world starting to repeat history. So, one of the points of reference that we can use for that is Matthew 24. The uh, 24... Uh, 32 to 34 it is. Parable of the fig tree. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that 
he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Okay. A lot of the biblical scholars and a lot of the interpretations that you'll read for this piece of passage is that the blooming of the fig tree represents the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Remember, uh, about 70 AD, the Romans just totally overturned Jerusalem. Not one stone was left unturned. They scattered the Jewish people around to all nations. And they literally destroyed the nation of Israel. So when the fig tree re-blossoms, re-blooms, know that he is near, know that the end times are coming. So if we look at the fig tree representing the birth of the nation of Israel, it really means 1948, because that's when the Jewish nation was reborn. 1948, the League of Nations, uh, as a result of the Balfour Declaration, signed into being the state and nation of Israel. Okay? That's history. You can find it in the history books. So, as a modern nation state, this is one of the signals that Jesus tells us is starting the clock for his return. When you see this happen, when you see that fig tree bloom, re blossom, know that the time is near. The clock is ticking. Also says that this generation will not pass away. Well, in the Bible it says that a generation is three score ten, which is 70 years. But with today's medical marvels and wonderful doctors that we have, we can extend that out to 100. True? I know, my mother's 96, so she's getting close to 100. So if we take 100 years as being a generation, let's have a look at what we've got. 76 years have already gone, 24 left. We're in the final quarter. What happens in the final quarter of a game when the players realise they're a little bit behind and we want to win this? What happens? You see them dig a little bit deeper. You see them push a bit harder. You see them pick the pace of the game up. You see them make plays a lot quicker. Isn't that what we're seeing in the world today? Time is short for him. That imitates a glory line. Isn't things starting to get a little bit quicker? So, we can make a good assumption based on scripture that the first seal was opened in 1948. So in 1948 was the start of putting into place the things that are going to bring to rise the beast or the Antichrist. What does history say happened in 1948? It's also when the League of Nations, which is later to become the United Nations, slowly began its push for one world government. It's also the start of a rise in American and Western military imperialism. America and the West involved itself in places like Korea, Vietnam, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and there's plenty more, and now through NATO, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So we have this Western imperialism that is now starting to push this agenda. Okay, so that's, now that's a bit of history, and it does back up the assumptions that we've been making. So the opening of the second seal is described in Revelation 6, Three, four. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, 
and there was given unto him a great sword. Have a look just in the US alone at how many shootings in schools. You haven't heard about the ones that have been stopped by people that were armed, like teachers and so forth, but you've heard about the ones where the shooters managed to shoot a few people. There's a bias in the media. Good news stories don't sell papers. So <clears throat> we can say there's been an increase in anger and violence and murders and so forth around the world. And the statistics prove that. So let's have a look at why. If we go to Matthew 24, 8, Jesus makes an allusion to signs of his coming as birth pains. At first, the signs may be faint and infrequently seen. It's like one going to labour, you know, has that first little nudge, it's like, oh, what was that? And it's hours later before the next one comes. And then they quicken. <coughs> so at first the signs may be faint and infrequently seen, however, as his return draws near, the signs will become more intense and frequent. Again, giving birth, start to get those contractions, they become more and more frequent and probably more intense. And probably at an exponential rate, so instead of it being a nice doubling, that just takes off like a rocket. The closer it is to his return, the quicker it will go. So, In regards to the effects of the riders of the apocalypse, the four horsemen, as Christ's return nears, the intensity and magnitude of their presence is going to increase. So where you have the red horse out there taking peace from the earth, it's going to happen much, much more rapidly. And we see that with the violence exploding across the world news reports. Well, that could very well be the rider on the red horse coming to the fullness of his power. We're seeing a lot of conflict happening. You've got Ukraine going on at the moment. We've also got Israel and Gaza. Now, I'll go into this a little bit shortly. But my question is this. Is the war between Israel and the mass biblical? I know there's a lot of people praying for that situation. If it's biblical, what's God's will? And are you praying against God's will? Because if you're a Christian and you're praying against God's will, that's not going to end up very well. So we need to have an understanding of what's going on in the world and what Scripture tells us. And so I'll, I'll open that up a little bit for you today. So regarding the third horseman, I'll come back to this. So regarding the third horseman, as in uh, Revelation 6, 5, 6, we can have the same argument that as time goes on, the frequency of these events from these horsemen, these apocalyptic horsemen, are going to become much, much more frequently intense. So on the third seal, when he opened the third seal, I heard the living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in its hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. Now a denarius was a day's wage back then. Anyone seen the prices in the supermarket? Yeah. Getting close to a day's wage for your grocery bill, isn't it? It wasn't like that a year or two ago. So the third seal refers to food shortages and hunger, which is very possible with today's cost of living. We can expect the inflation that's gripping the world to take off. It's, it's going to intensify. And with that, commodity prices, which are grain prices, are going to increase. So the price of bread is going up. Your savings will go up in price. 
Your overall cost of living could very well rise faster than your income is able to keep up with it. When that happens, what do we normally do? We cut back on everything. We can only afford what we can afford. At that point, we'll start to see things like food prices becoming very expensive. We're going to see malnutrition. We're going to see starvation. And it's compounded by something else that they're not really telling you about in the news. Has anyone here heard about carbon credits? No. Okay, something they've been softening us up for about the last 20 years. Carbon credits. Well, you know that in the US, one particular very wealthy individual has been buying up the farmland, and he is now the largest private owner of farmland in the US. And his intent is not to farm that land. There's another purpose he owns it. You see, what they've been, the United Nations has been doing is they've been saying, well, if you farm so many hectares or acres and you grow a crop, it has this much of a carbon footprint. So we'll allocate that to the land. If you grow animals, it has this much of a carbon footprint. So owning the land that has the capability to produce that food with that carbon footprint, if you do not produce the food, you can sell that carbon credit to that factory over there that needs to buy it, and you can sell it at whatever price you want. So by locking up farmland, they've been able to capture the carbon that it would have created and offset it by selling it. And making more money out of selling the carbon credits than they are growing too. What would you do? If your intent was to make money. So we now have a, a threat to our food security, which is going to lead to food shortages. Why? Because somebody is driving for the dollar. <coughs> Wars around the world that are currently being waged. They're inflationary. Think of Ukraine. Ukraine is one of the largest producers of wheat in the world. What's happening to that wheat at the moment? Well, at the moment, those wheat fields are a battlefield, so nothing's really happening. There's a shortage of wheat. It's great for the wheat farmers here because the prices worldwide will go up. But for consumers of bread and other products that use wheat, they will also go up. And we, not, we are not the growers of the wheat, so we're not getting the increase in price. We're getting the increase in price in the commodities we buy, not the ones we sell. So for the average person, everything will go up. Inflationary, because there's trade disruption. Inflationary, because they're also driven by the arms and munition conglomerates. Have you noticed how this Western military imperialization is always involving itself in conflicts that escalate up and then they've got to give billions of dollars of aid and arms and so forth? And usually that comes with long strings attached. Remember the scripture, don't harm the oil? Well, I don't think it's talking about the olive oil, I think it's talking about petroleum oil. War machines will not move unless they have oil. You can't fly your bombers and you can't move your tanks. When I look at what's going on in the world, I see that arms and munition conglomerates are making mega dollar profits at our misery. Because all of these wars are creating a lot of death. And so if we look at the opening of the fourth seal, we can see quite explicitly as foretold in Revelation 6, 7 and 8. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth beast saying, Come and see. And I looked. Behold, a pale horse. 
Uh, and some scripture talks about a pale green horse. For those of you that watch the zombie movies, it's that pale green of the dead body. Those that watch the zombie movies know the colour. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. As I mentioned about the Western military machine, it's been waging war in places like Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and other places. We've seen hundreds of thousands of people die, millions have suffered. It's spilled over into Africa. I mean, the French were in Chad a number of years ago, creating mayhem. Sudan has had civil war. So you now have North and South Sudan, treated as two separate countries. Seeing more death and suffering um, and societal chaos stemming from these acts of military expansion. I mean, let's face it, Korea, Korea, North and South were having a civil war. Why did the West get involved? Vietnam, they were having a civil war. The French pulled out, so the Americans decided to take the West in there as well. What were we doing? Saddam Hussein had his population under control. He might not have been the best person in the world, but he had his population under control. Once that balance was upset, look at what we got out of it. ISIS and terrorism around the world. So this chaos that's been created by the fourth seal, pale horse, it's been a very large factor in the martyrdom of Christians. Does anyone know who the Uyghur are? Uyghur are Muslim minority. What about the full on gone? Chinese Christians. Persecution of those two groups has been very well documented. But there's also many other groups that are being persecuted as well. And you see, Part of the reason that this is happening is because there are so many pieces of scripture that foretell it. And, and as I said, I'm going to we'll open the fifth seal and then I'm going to dig into this war between Israel and Hamas and find out and take us through the journey and see if it's biblical. So when the Lamb opened the fifth seal, he goes on to say, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been violently killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony they had given. These are the martyrs. These are the Christians that have stood on the ground for Christ. The opening of the fifth seal is seen through the persecution and murder of believers in the dominion of deaths and hades. The murder of believers is an ongoing it's, it's so ongoing in this world with places like China and India who also have persecution of Christians in some places. It's not only in the Muslim nations where as a Christian you're going to be very persecuted, but it's now also happening in Christian nations. We have these people that are waving the flag of a foreign nation and they're telling us, they're chanting these slogans that have very, very deep meaning if you're not actually understanding what Phrases like river to the sea mean. <clears throat> so, this part here of the, the fifth seal, when did that start? When did the real persecution of Christians, I mean, it's been going on for quite some time, but when did it really pick up and really, really start in earnest? We were warned as Christians, we were warned very, very much about this. Has so anyone know, read the book of Revelation, Revelation 12? And I looked up and I saw a woman bathed in the sun with the moon and the stars, 12 stars of a crown, giving birth to a male child and a dragon. A red dragon came and swept the woman. Okay? 
Revelation 12 was a story about the war in heaven. It's about the devil and the angels being cast to earth. It's about how once they were cast to earth, they persecuted and chased the church. They couldn't get Jesus and beat to death. So they went after the church. And they can't get the church, or maybe they have got the church, with this one world religion. But now they're coming after those that honestly and earnestly believe. And if you do read in the book of Revelation about that fifth seal, what you're going to read is you're going to read that it started in 2017. When Revelation 12 prophecy actually happened in the sky, astronomically. Constellation of Virgo is the woman. And the sun and the moon were in those positions. The, the uh, constellation of Leo, which has nine stars, sits above the crown of Virgo. But at that particular time, there were also three planets in there, making up a total of 12. You would have had to have had a total eclipse of the sun to be able to see it because it was during the day. The sun was sitting in the middle of the constellation Virgo. So we've seen the sign and without understanding astronomy, we would never have known that to happen. But because we have such great maps of the stars and the sky and the movements and we can plot these things, we were able to foretell it. it was going to happen even though you couldn't visibly see it in the eye. At that point, persecution of Christians intensified. And in places like America, Christians were being arrested for praying for over each other. We saw it before our eyes. So as far as the seals go, I'm going to stop at that point. The sixth seal is for another day. And I just want to come back to, is the war between Israel and Hamas scripture? We know we're living in the end times because there are so many pieces of scripture that tell us that throughout the Bible. So is what is happening in Gaza, from, what's going on from God's point of view? Let's look and see what God says about this rather than what the talking head on the TV says. Is he fulfilling the command that he gave to the Jews 3,000 years ago? When he told Joshua to take out all the inhabitants of the land that he had promised to the Israelites and their strongholds. Joshua 11.22 Joshua did as the Lord commanded except in three places. Now the command was to take out all of the people. None of the Anakim were left in the land of the children of Israel. They remained only in Gaza and Gath and Asher. Um, what's significant is that subsequently in later scripture, Gath and Ashod are also destroyed, so only Gaza has remained unconquered. So now we have the Anakim still in Gaza. So the question is, who are the Anakim? They are A group of people that descend from Anax. And he was the son of Arba. And the Anakim are a race of warlike, uh, warlike people. Now, this is a probably a whole new one for another day. But they're mentioned in the Bible. And later on, Gaza is mentioned again in Judges. 
16.21. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. So we hear that Gaza is the thorn in the side of the Israelis in their land. Constantly warlock. I've seen an interview between a Muslim Arab where he says that he would rather have a Jew live in his house than one of his Palestinians from Gaza because he knows who the Jew is. They descended from the same lineage. Isaac and Ishmael. They have a common ancestor. But he says to the Palestinians, who are you? You're the flotsam. Who are you? And you also notice that the Muslim nations around there, Jordan, mm -hmm. Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, are not letting any of the Palestinians into their territory. Because they have long memories. They remember what these people do. So I want to close today with a prophecy on Gaza. And as I said, many people are praying for this situation. So I'm going to read this prophecy out from Zechariah 9. And then we're going to talk about some prayer points for the church. A prophecy. The word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach and will come to rest on Damascus. For the eyes of all people and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. And so on Hamath too, which borders on it, and on Tyre and Sidon, uh, that's uh, Syria and Lebanon, though they are very skillful, Tyre has built herself a stronghold. She has heaped up silver like dust and gold like dirt in the streets. But the Lord will take away her possessions and destroy her power on the sea and she will be consumed by fire. Ashkelon, I see it and fear. Gaza will writhe in agony, and Ekron too, for her hope will wither. Gaza will lose her king. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. And if you go on to read it, it's next line is basically, um, Basically, yeah, keeps on going and see what it says. Put me into the pride of the Philistines, who are the ones that are associated with Gaza. So the prophecy, this is just one of a number of prophecies that say that Gaza will not survive. So let's talk about the prayer points. You see, if this is God's will, if this is God's will, to absolutely get rid of the anarchy, once and for all. You can understand why the Israeli, Israeli Defence Force is saying, we will exterminate them, we will take no prisoners, we will get rid of the lot once and for all. They've been a thorn in their side for 3,000 years. So let's make sure that we are careful not to pray against God's will. So if we want to pray for the situation in Gaza, and Israel, then we need to pray on these points. We need to pray for Jesus to continue to reveal himself to the Arab population and Hamas. We need to continue to pray for Jesus to continue to reveal himself and open the eyes of Hamas so that they realize they're not fighting against Israel, they are fighting against God, and when you fight against God, you will lose. You will always lose. Amen. And we also need to pray for Jesus to give people the discernment to see beyond the bias of the media. Amen. And we also need to pray for Jesus to show himself and reveal himself as the Jewish Messiah to both the secular and the Orthodox Jews. If we do that and they all come together with Jesus, then this will stop. So, if we pray, please pray for what God's will is. 
Pray for the blessings to those that are there. Pray, most importantly, for the blessings on Israel. Yes. For we are grafted into that pot. There's so much more that's been revealed to me as I've been putting all this down. Which I'll share another day. Praise you, Father, for blessing us with ears to hear, Lord, your message. Thank you, Lord, that you have shown us through Scripture what our future is. Lord, you have given us discernment so that we are able to distinguish between what is scriptural and what sounds scriptural. Thank you, Father, for giving us your word, your heart, and most importantly, Father, your spirit and the blood covering of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray a blessing to all of all nations that they may find you. For those that have known you and have turned away, that they turn back. And for those that have yet to know your name and, and have yet to become to know you, may, Lord, your name be put on their hearts so they seek you out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.